fairly fast on some occasions, and sometimes I know my accent probably. Uh, we didn't. We Texans really didn't realize that we had an accent, but uh, uh, my accent may uh, cause you some problems. So I will do my best to be deliberate and not uh, not use too many tele Texas colloquialisms. Speaking of Texas colloquialisms, <laughs> uh, this is my friend T.D. Ernest, when stand-up T.D., and he travels with me regularly and uh, also is uh, very good in the area of healing, and uh, it's always a pleasure to have T.D. with me. The T.D. stands for Tulsa Don. Tulsa is a city in Oklahoma, so he's not really from Texas, but uh, he uh, he's a lovely guy, uh, very... Uh, uh, in love with Jesus, has a lovely wife and family, and uh, he is a real pleasure to uh, have as a friend. We're going to be doing a Christ-centered uh, healing seminar here this morning. Uh, I know that uh, I've got it misspelled. Uh, I'm spelling it in the American way, centered. And uh, so um, just, you'll just have, to, just have to abide with us on that because we uh, Americans are we're a little slow to spell things correctly, I think. Uh, if you look at the verse of scriptures on the cover of the booklet, this is really kind of where I want to begin, um, where it says, Come to me, all who, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my load is light. Uh, the phrase that I want to focus on is here, Jesus says, learn from me. And this is what we're going to be doing this morning. We'll be focusing on, when I say Christ-centered, what I mean is that we are learning from Jesus Christ uh, about healing. It's not just cross-centered. There are many healing ministries that are cross-centered. They, they believe that you receive healing because, you, because of what Jesus did at the cross. I believe that too. However, that we're more than just cross-centered. We're Christ-centered. If you're Christ-centered, you have both the cross and Christ himself. We don't believe that Jesus somehow or another just came and did these things uh, for three years and we were to neglect what he taught his disciples, but rather we are to learn from him exactly what they, uh, they were taught. Uh, I shared my testimony last night and one of the things that changed my experience in the area of healing was really meditating on the Gospels, really seeing what Jesus taught his disciples. And that made a huge difference in what I understood to be the will of God and understood what God wished to do for people when they stood in front of me. And so this morning we're going to begin to look at uh, what did Christ teach his disciples. We're going to focus in on that. The first section that we're going to be talking about is transfer of ministry. Uh, it's very clear to me that Jesus trained 12 ordinary men to do his work. Uh, everybody say ordinary. I was using the word rascals last night, and, and I really mean that. Uh, if you look at these guys, he didn't choose the most religious of his day. He didn't choose the most educated. Uh, he chose those that were available. <laughs> the ones that responded to his call, and you would have to describe them as, uh, I guess you would call them street people in some ways today. They were fishermen and ordinary folks in every respect, and he was able to train them to do his, his ministry, and as a result, he was able to transform, uh, transform the world. There's, a, there's over one billion of us that call upon his name. Uh, we're the, Christianity is the large, world's largest religion, so obviously these 12 men, 70 more, had, uh, they were successful in duplicating the ministry of Christ. Everyone say duplicating. This is really what I believe that Jesus intended. He didn't intend for people to just be people who come and sit in a building and sit in pews and worship for an hour every Sunday. Uh, rather, he intended for people to duplicate his ministry, to, for us to be uh, like him in every respect. So let's read it, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 9, verse 35, and I'm going to read through 10-2. There is no chapter divisions in the original, so you will we'll pick it up in chapter 10 just in a few moments. Jesus was going about all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. And seeing the multitudes, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and downcast like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. So what we see here is the pattern of Jesus' ministry, going from place to place, traveling ministry, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, 
and healing every kind of sickness and every kind of disease. Is there anything new under the sun, by the way? So there were viruses in Jesus' day, or is that something that we've invented in the modern age? There were viruses and bacteria. There were genetic problems. There were all the things that we face today were happening in Jesus' day, and he healed them all. Now, what happens is, is that when you teach on healing and you minister healing, you discover that sometimes people can visualize certain things happening because they can see how a natural con uh, you know, sickness can progress to a healing. They can visualize that. They understand the concepts. But when it is something genetic or is something uh, disabling or even a loss uh, lost of, of an organ in some sort of way, they have a hard time visualizing how that might happen. Uh, well, join the club. There's no one that really can visualize some of these things. We have a, there are some examples in front of my eyes that I can bring to you. I prayed for a girl, for instance, in, uh, in Canada, uh, in Ontario, who was born without any, um, any hair follicles. She had no eyebrows, no hair on her arms, uh, nothing, no, uh, no hair anywhere on her body. And a teenage girl, uh, completely bald when I met her. And uh, so what do you, how do you visualize God fixing this problem? Um, you know, I have no way to visualize it. I, you know, nothing, uh, nothing in my experience tells me what could happen in this circumstance. However, I do know that God is a God of the miraculous. And uh, I had preached on a particular verse of Scripture that particular day, and she had responded. I had said that if uh, the Lord says, the Father, he says of the Father, if, if we know how to give, give good gifts to our children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give good gifts to them who ask? And I use that as a principle to encourage people to pray for things that they wouldn't ordinarily pray for. For instance, um, I think I even use this illustration. If you had a son who was going bald, and was within your capacity to help that son not go bald, and you, uh, you really could do this for him, would you do it? And the answer, of course, is of, of course you would do it. If he didn't want to go bald and you had, you had the capacity as a parent to prevent that from happening, you would do what's in your power to do that. Well, here's Jesus inviting us to compare what we would do as parents with what the Heavenly Father will do. If you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give good gifts to them who ask? So if we would do it for our children, then God will do it for us. So it opens up a whole new realm of what uh, what's possible in the kingdom. It shows us that God's will perhaps is, it has a greater uh, width and depth than we would ever imagine. That God is willing to do many things that perhaps we not thought him be willing to do. Well, this girl responded to this. She even came up and asked me. She said, did my situation fit this category? If, if my parent was willing to fix this if they, it was in their capacity so that I would have hair? Would that, uh, would that work? And uh, I mean, would, uh, would, uh, are you saying that the Heavenly Father would be willing to do this? And I said, certainly. I said, if you're a parent to be willing to do it, then certainly the Heavenly Father is willing to do it. And uh, so we prayed for her that day. She got intensely hot. She radiated heat. I have no idea what's going to happen. I don't really you know, try to describe to God what He can do. I just believe that He can do things. And uh, by the next day, she was starting to develop hair follicles all over. She, uh, in fact, six months later, um, in fact, I, I went back to the same region of Canada, and I've heard, uh, heard stories that she's got complete, set of complete hair on her head and eyebrows, everything very normal. She sent me an email about six months after this and told me that we needed to pray more specifically. She was being funny because now she said she had to shave her legs. So. <laughs> Now, how do you visualize something like this happening, you know? You can't do it, and so uh, you don't try to. You just know that Father's able to do these things when you pray. You look to the cross, you believe that Jesus has paid the price, and you're able to receive those things. So when we say every kind of sickness and every kind of disease, what we need to realize is that nothing is out of our reach because of what Jesus has done. Nothing is out of your reach because of what Jesus has done. Nothing was out of the reach of the disciples, as we're going to see in a moment that all things are possible to him who believes, even if we can't figure out how that might happen. There is a, a man who traveled through the south part of the United States many years ago. His name was, his name was uh, Ronnie Coyne. And Ronnie, in a prayer meeting, uh, the group of believers that were with him got inspired. He was born without one eye. He, he just had a socket there, 
no nerves, nothing. Uh, no, no capacity to see from that eye. Well, the Christians that were with him believed it was possible that he could uh, receive a healing in that area. They prayed for him, and of course, after they're done, nothing in the socket, so they assumed that nothing particularly had happened. Well, when Ronnie put his glass eye back in, he could see with 20-20 vision through the glass eye. <laughs> Someone asked me, could he take it out and look around corners? I didn't... <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> so how do you visualize this? How do you, you know, how do you determine those kinds of things? Well, you can't. And see, that's the, the problem is, is that we want to bring it down to something we can analyze and figure out how it might happen. Well, let's just assume that it can without necessarily knowing exactly how. I have no idea how God heals some things that I pray for, but he does. He bypasses some problems. We prayed for a little boy years ago who uh, was blind in his right eye. He had uh, been born uh, without vision in that eye. He had, uh, his retina was completely detached. He had scar tissue over the back of the eye. His eye was opaque. No light could pass through his eye. And when we prayed for this young boy, who was, I think he was nine at the time, his name was David. When we prayed for David, he immediately had vision in that eye. And when he went back to a doctor, went to an ophthalmologist, uh, the ophthalmologist said there's no way he should be able to see through the eye, no change in the eye. The, the eye remained the same, yet he had 20-20 vision through that eye. So God is able not only to take things that are broken and fix them, but he's also able to bypass that which is broken. So we don't necessarily need to you know, dictate to God how he's going to do something in any kind of way. So every kind of sickness and every kind of disease. Here in this passage, what we see is that Jesus feels compassion for the multitudes. If you could read between the lines uh, here, he sees the distressed condition of the multitudes. And he's saying, I'm only one man. And look at this tremendous amount of need that is present here. And then he goes on to say, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Now, the church often, uh, at least in America, has this backwards. We think that the problem is out there. We think that there's a problem with the harvest. But Jesus doesn't say there's a problem with the harvest. The harvest is plentiful. Another place he says, the fields are white with harvest. The problem is not them, but rather not enough the right kind of workers. So he, here he's multiplying himself in the next verse, in chapter 10, verse 1, and having summoned his 12 disciples, he gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. He's multiplying himself in 12 ordinary men. And this is the pattern that we see in the New Testament. That, see, all of us really realize that are sitting here that Christ is the answer for the world. We understand that Jesus Christ is the light of the world, and he is the answer for the world. But what we may not have understood entirely, it's not just Jesus, but it's Jesus in us. We need to have his ministry multiplied in us so that when we go out, that we can help with the distressed and downcast sheep of the world. That this, uh, we're not just looking for any kind of workers. What we want is Christ-like workers, people that can do what Jesus himself did, ministering to the, the sick ministering to those who are demonized and helping them uh, deal with their distress and downcast conditions. Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 through 9, it says, These twelve Jesus sent out after instructing them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter any city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Freely you, you have received, freely give. Do not acquire gold and silver for your money belts, as Jesus goes on to talk about. Now here what we see is the multiplication of Jesus' ministry in very specific terms. He, first of all, he says to the disciples, preach the very same message you heard me preaching. Go preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's happening now. It's happening in your midst. Uh, and then he says to do these four things. Heal the sick, raise the dead, Cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. By the way, if you're doing those four things, you're probably going to stay pretty busy. <laughs> and you're doing, I would, that probably describes 95% of Jesus' ministry. You know, notice Jesus doesn't say, go walk, walk on water, and he doesn't say, you know, curse fig trees and that sort of thing. He does say in other places that these things are possible. But these are the primary things that his, these 12 ordinary men were called to. I want you to notice that when Jesus says heal the sick, there's no parentheses here. 
He doesn't say to the, on the side, there's no footnote that basically says, but, but he whispered to them, but maybe God doesn't want to heal some of them. He just says, heal the sick. It's an imperative. It's a command in Scripture. Jesus tells these 12 ordinary men, heal the sick. As if he expected them to do it. As if he knew they could. Now this is very important stuff because we need to get these guys off the stained glass and back down to reality. These were ordinary men who chose to follow Jesus. And as a result of that, Jesus began to multiply his ministry in them. This is, this is God's will for his people, to be like Jesus. Turn to somebody and say, you're a rascal, but you can be like Jesus. <laughs> some, some cultures, people don't like to insult each other, but here apparently you do, so. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Freely you have received. Freely give. He expected them to be able to give it. Remember Peter at the temple gate, the lame man? He said to the lame man, silver and gold have I none. Most of us understand that much, don't we? <laughs> silver and gold have I none, but such that I have, I give to you. Peter knew he had it to give. He knew that Christ had given him the capacity to do this. And see, whether we get somebody healed or not, I, have, I know that Jesus is in me, and Jesus is a healer, and I have the capacity, if I don't get him healed the first time, then perhaps the second or the third. I don't, I don't doubt the capacity of God in me, Christ in me, to do these things. I don't always get it done, but I know that it's quite possible every time I pray that something is going to occur. Everybody get this? Same thing's true with you. You've got the same Jesus I do. You know, years ago, uh, I bought my first computer. I won't tell you how long ago that was. But uh, a long time ago, and uh, uh, I'd heard some terrible things about computers. I heard about that they could get sick, get viruses. And I'd heard that they could be crashed. That sounded terrible. And uh, you could crash your computer. You know, I... And so I, uh, probably the first time I ever did this, but I read the instructions entirely through before I actually turned it on. Because <laughs> it was expensive to start with. And secondly, I didn't know what I was doing. And so I was apprehensive about the whole thing and, uh, and didn't have enough knowledge to really understand exactly what was going on with it because it was my first experience with it. So I remember turning on that, turning on that computer with some apprehension, not knowing what I was getting into. And I discovered, uh, I actually bought it because I was doing, uh, I was in, in school and needed something to do word, word processing on. That's why I bought it originally. And what a wonderful thing this was. Instead of having to use type, you know, type things over and over again and get those things, I, all I had to do was make corrections. What a, I, it was an amazing discovery there. And it wasn't too long till I discovered that I could play missile defense on it. You remember how little? <laughs> wow, it could, I could play games on it. You know, that was really a revelation to discover. Not only can I do word processing, I could also uh, play games on it. And then I discovered I could balance my checkbook on it. Wow, you know. And little by little, I discovered it had all these capabilities. They were always there. I just didn't know about them. They were, they were, I was not equipped to understand this thing. And what happened was in that process, so somewhere in that process, I discovered that uh, crashing the computer wasn't really all that big a deal. That as long as I was saving what I was working on, then crashing it wasn't a big deal. Uh, so that fear of crashing the computer kind of went out the window. And I discovered that you could do things to deal with the whole subject of viruses. And that I think uh, in my own, I've been playing with computers now for, I don't know, probably 35 years or so. And in any case, uh, you know, I probably only had one, I think maybe one or two infections from viruses in that whole period of time. Why? Because I became wiser about what to do and what not to do. And uh, so I learned how to deal with, minimize the risk there. And when I did get infected, I discovered it really wasn't that a big deal. We could fix the infection. So what happens is the fears I had began to disappear. Then I became bolder and bolder and bolder on uh, dealing with these things and finally, finally discovered that uh, I could actually do programming. 
and I started doing some programming and discovered that just about everything with a computer that I could eventually learn, their learning curve was not that steep on many things that I could learn how to do these things. What I'm saying to you is that this computer had all this capability in the beginning, but I didn't know that. I was unequipped. My, emotionally, I was unequipped to deal with it. Well, that's kind of like Jesus in you. He's there, and he's capable of a great deal of things that you're probably not aware of him being capable of. But that's what equipping is about. You begin to understand what God's willing to do, and you begin to be able to deal with your fears. You begin to deal with the issues that come up in your mind that prevents you from receiving all that Jesus wants for you and also ministering to others. I promise you that Jesus in you right now can do miracles. Just a matter of understanding that. A matter of allowing him to do it. Most people are looking for more. They're waiting for the other shoe to drop, the proverbial other shoe to drop. Can I promise you something? There is no other shoe. Sooner or later, you just have to believe and move on and begin to accept the fact that, that Jesus is in you and that he wants to do good things through you. Come on, shake your head up on that. You agree with that? Okay. <laughs> Jesus trained and sent 70 more. Now after this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them two and two ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was going to come. And he was saying to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. Same problem. The harvest is okay, but the labors are few. We don't have enough people to go to deal with this. Therefore beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your ways. Behold, I send you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no shoes, and greet no one on the way. This is Luke's Gospel, chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. Now here we see Jesus is even, again, he's disconnecting at the end of this passage, in the end of the one that I have printed in the booklet, the whole idea of financing. One of the things that uh, we believe is that that Christians really do need to learn that, uh, that God will provide for them. If they serve Jesus in the, the way that he's describing in the 12, that, that, that all that they need will be provided for them to do that. They don't have to learn to tax the church in order for this to, for this to happen. Um, I really could spend the whole, the whole seminar talking to you about what God has done in my finances over the years. But I've seen the miraculous in my finances at, at such a level that I don't really have to count on the church to support me at all. Uh, the Lord is taking care of me. And he will take care of you, too, if you serve him in this way. Some of the fears that people have is that if I really give myself entirely to Jesus in this way, that somehow or another my family will suffer. Well, my family has not suffered at all. I've had all the resources I've needed and plenty more beyond that. On uh, one occasion, the Lord told me to do one thing. Uh, and one thing only. It didn't make sense at the time, but uh, after four months had transpired after I had done this one thing, uh, my net worth increased by $800,000. So God knows how to supply his children, uh, and they don't have to count on the church to do that. Uh, God has plenty of resources. He owns all the cattle on all the hills. And he can slaughter a few if he needs, needs to take care of you. <laughs> Moving right along here. We noticed that Jesus has sent 70 more. So here in Jesus' own day, there were more than 80 people doing his ministry successfully. Now, this is very interesting stuff because we see that there is a pattern in, in this. Now, most people, when you talk to the people out there in the world, they're aware that Jesus healed the sick, but they're not aware that there were 80 more people in Jesus' own day doing it. They're unaware that this was a common element in the church. In fact, it, probably the most common thing that Christians did in the early church was heal the sick. The entire Roman Empire by 313 A.D. was evangelized. In 313 A.D., Constantine declared the empire Christian. He might as well that most of the people were Christians. And that was under persecution and great difficulty. And if we read through the history of the church, particularly during that period of time, what you see is even the enemies of the church were very aware that the ordinary Christians were healing the sick. There's one Roman emperor that escapes me what his name is. I'll have to go back and look that up. I can't try to remember that. But in any case, one Roman emperor who in his uh, literature that exists today, in his writings that exist today, he says in so many words, I'm paraphrasing, so what if these Christians are healing the sick and raising the dead? It doesn't mean that they're right about this. <laughs> and so even, though, even the enemies of the church were very aware of the, of the early church's capacity to heal the sick. Very common 
very common thing happening in the church's experience. And I believe that as we approach the end of the age, we're going to see it's going to become very, very common again. In fact, in many places, it is becoming common that, uh, that every service that they have in some churches, they, they see people healed. And there's no reason why that can't be true here as well. That it just becomes an expectation that when we gather together, where two or three are gathered together in his name, he is there in the midst. And if Jesus was present anywhere, there was healing happening. So there should be healing happening when we gather together. So it should be very, very common uh, among us. Verse uh, 9 here, Luke chapter 10, verse 9, Jesus says, Heal those in it who are sick and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. Same message, same expectation, heal the sick. Verse 17, the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. So they, the 70 were doing all the things that the 12 were doing before. It was an ordinary expectation of the early church that, uh, that healing would occur. What if I'm not called to heal the sick? You are called if you're a believer. Mark's Gospel, chapter 16, verses 16 and 17 says, And these signs will accompany those who have believed. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. If they, pick up, they will pick up serpents. And if they drink any deadly poison, it shall not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. So this is an expectation of Jesus that you will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. It's, uh, it's not just ha- shouldn't just happen in churches. It should happen in your living room. It should happen, you know, over your coffee, over coffee, uh, tea, at different times. I mean, any place, any time that you're gathered with other people and uh, you present the good news uh, to someone, there's no reason why someone can't receive a healing in that circumstance. Uh, my wife and I uh, have seen lots of healing happening in our home. Of course, we, we minister out of our home. The Lord dropped a unusually big house into our lap, and we can see it about uh, oh, 70, maybe 70 comfortably in our living room. And uh, so we do meetings there, uh, and, we, and we have six, seven bedrooms, and so we have people coming and going all the time. However, my wife, uh, uh, you know, uh, in fact, when she saw this house, she said, I don't think I can clean it. And I said, well, if the Lord uh, provides the house for us, which he is, uh, then, you know, he'll provide for someone to help you with it. And so anyway, she, uh, she hired a, a lady to help her do it, do, clean the house. And uh, one, late, one, t- one time this lady came in and she, was having, she had influenza. Thank you for bringing it into my home. Um, anyway, she was running fever, but she needed the money and she didn't want to miss the opportunity. And she wasn't obviously feeling very poorly. And uh, so I, I offered to pray for her and uh, she turned me down. She went to a church that didn't believe in healing. And uh, I thought uh, later on, I went back to my office and thought maybe I'd let her off the hook too easily. The southern part of the United States uh, is culturally polite. Uh, we call it southern hospitality. And so you, oftentimes uh, you can use that to your advantage in, in, in ministry because people will say yes to you when they actually mean no. Um, because they're trying to be polite to you. So you can use it. But in this case, she did tell me no. But I thought maybe I had been too polite about it. And so I came under some conviction of the spirit that I probably needed to press the issue a little more with her. So I went and got my wife in this case because I thought maybe that she might have been embarrassed because it was just me talking to her rather than my wife and I talking to her. So the two of us ganged up on this lady. (laughs) And we said, you came into our home and you were feeling ill and we believe Jesus will heal you. And uh, so we're not going to let you say no to us this time. So we're going to pray for you. And I promise you it won't hurt you. And uh, so we, she reluctantly agreed. We don't usually do it this way, but uh, we felt we should in this circumstance. In any case, uh, we laid hands on this, this woman, and pretty soon she was going, what's that? What's that? And I said, uh, are you feeling something in particular? And she says, I feel like uh, electricity. I feel like electricity is running in my body. And I said, well, that's what people call the power of God. I didn't feel anything. She, she was feeling something. And I said, people call that the power of God. And yes, it does feel a little bit like electricity. And, uh, and I said, what it means is, is that you don't have the flu anymore. <laughs> you, you don't have influenza any longer. And, uh, and immediately, I mean, she, uh, she immediately was acknowledged the fact that she felt much better. And uh, within a few minutes, she knew that she didn't have the flu any longer. So, you know, you can minister healing anywhere. It doesn't have to be in front of a church. It doesn't have to be... Uh, I've, we've ministered healing in Starbucks. Uh, I've ministered to waitresses. Uh, you know, I ask them how they are, 
when they bring bring our uh, uh, when they bring the menus and really can try to talk to them, interact with them, and if they're not, you know, try to get some honesty out of them. How if their feet hurt or their back hurts or something that would be typical with waitresses, uh, then we minister to them if we get an opportunity if they if they allow it. Sometimes we just quietly do it in the restaurant, and oftentimes we'll hear a testimony before we leave that they are feeling much much better. There's no reason why you can't bring healing everywhere you go. And I know cultures or different cultures handle things differently. But uh, you know how this culture works, and so you probably can figure out how to bring healing to, in this circumstance, uh, uh, in, in circumstances where you're maybe having tea with someone. That works pretty well, actually. So in any case, Jesus expects they will lay hands on the sick and they will receive. Here is a promise of the Lord to you. You will, as a believer, lay hands on the sick, and they will receive. That's a promise to you. Now, some of us have been taught we have to be anointed to do this. Ever heard that idea? Anointed? Or you have to be gifted? Well, let me just say this to you. If you're waiting to be anointed, and you're waiting to be gifted, you're not believing. You're not believing. It's not, this, this promise doesn't say anything about being anointed or being gifted. It just says those who believe. So you disqualify yourself by waiting for something to happen when all you have to do is believe. Come on, shake your head. You get this? We've seen five-year-olds minister healing successfully. There's a nine-year-old boy named Aaron. Uh, I was ministering in Massachusetts and... Uh, this little boy, one of the services, as I was praying for the sick, came up to me, nine years old, and didn't know his name or how old he was at the time, but I found out later. And he said, can I pray for the sick too? And I said, well, sure, why not? And so he stood there, and he mimicked me. Uh, in fact, you know, people would come up, and, he, and Aaron would put his hands on them, and he'd say, I feel heat. Do you feel heat? <laughs> and the person would say, actually, I do. I feel something. And Aaron probably ministered successfully to maybe 20 people in that service that received healing through Aaron, through Aaron ministering to them. I just stood there and watched him, encouraged him. Yeah, go ahead, Aaron, just do that. And uh, after, the next day I was talking to the pastor of this church, and he said to me, uh, oh, was the Lord really making, uh, making your point using Aaron, that God will use anyone and wants to use anyone? And uh, I said, well, you know, that's, that's good. That's what I'm preaching. He says, no, 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 you don't really understand, Roger. That's the goofiest kid in our church. I, the reason I have a lock on my office door is because of this particular kid. Because he's always into everything. And it said, by God using Aaron, everyone knew that God was saying, uh, if, I, if I'll use Aaron, I'll use you. <laughs> well, believe me, um, if my wife was sitting here and I said this in front of her, I said, if God will use Roger, he'll use anyone, my wife would say, Amen. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, you qualify for healing because you're a believer, not for any other reason. You know, because of what Jesus has done, you don't qualify because you have a feeling of being powerful. That's what people are looking for when they're looking for the anointing. They're looking for a feeling for being powerful, but that doesn't get people healed. Not you feeling powerful does not heal people. It's what Jesus has done at the cross. So you're, if you're looking for a feeling of feeling powerful, get over it. Because it will not work to get people healed. It's not your feeling. In fact, I feel very dependent, not powerful, dependent upon the Lord. And the more dependent I am upon Him, the more people I see healed. Come on. that right, Helen? That's absolutely right. She knows it too. Hallelujah. I won't ask TD because he always agrees with me anyway. So. Section two here, model of ministry is Christ. Now, this is uh, fundamental uh, to, I know that's a bad word in some circles, but it's fundamental to getting healing working, is understanding that Christ is the pattern of ministry. Uh, he reveals the perfect will of God to us. Now, this is in the middle of page three in the booklet, if you're trying to keep up there. John chapter one, verse 18, from the Amplified Version, it says this, No man has seen God at any time, the only unique Son, the only begotten God who's in the bosom, that is in the intimate presence of the Father. He has declared Him. He has revealed Him, brought Him out where He may be seen or can be seen. He has interpreted Him, and He has made Him known. 
uh, if I replace the pronouns in the last half of the verse above here, it reads like this. Jesus Christ has declared the Father. Jesus Christ has revealed the Father, brought the Father out where the Father can be seen. Jesus Christ has interpreted the Father, and Jesus Christ has made the Father known. I don't know if you've noticed this. It's a little paradoxical the way I'm saying it, but uh, have you noticed that God is invisible? Yeah, see, that's part, that's part of the problem is that God is invisible, therefore we have a little trouble sometimes interpreting his actions. You know, uh, a disaster happens. Um, the city of New Orleans is overrun by a storm. Uh, the levees break, uh, you know, it's flooded. Lots of people lose their lives. Is this God doing this or is it something else? We can't tell. By looking, you have to do it by interpretation, yes? So how do we, are from this verse and this verse alone, how are we to interpret the Father's actions? How are we to know what Father is doing? Because we can't see Him. Okay? Very important for us to be able to do this because the theology that we have will cause us to interpret things. And we can misinterpret based on misunderstandings. Lots of people do it. Lots of people misunderstand things and sometimes adopt superstitious viewpoints. Um, so, here, Jesus, uh, Jesus Christ, of course, is the answer. Jesus Christ reveals to us what the Father is like. I'm reading that section again. Jesus Christ has declared the Father. Jesus Christ has revealed the Father. Brought the Father out where the Father can be seen. Jesus Christ has interpreted the Father, and Jesus Christ has made the Father known. Here's a simple truth. It's right there in the next section, top of page 4. Simple truth, but profound truth that when you begin to apply it, particularly to the ideas of what is the will of God for your life, it's, uh, it's, it will, it's life changing. It, I have to admit to you that it really changed the way that I thought about things when I began to realize this. The Father is like the Son, the Son is like the Father. If you want to know what God the Father is about, what He's interested in, you look at Jesus. That he is revealing the Father perfectly. See, most of us have understand this business that Jesus was sinless. He didn't commit any sins. Everybody understand that? He didn't do anything wrong. It's another way of saying he did not do anything wrong. But what we don't get sometimes is the flip side of that, the other side of the coin, which is a similar truth, but uh, it's not always very well stated in the church, is that not only did Jesus not do anything wrong, he always did exactly what was right. You understand the opposite of this? It's, it's a similar truth. And this is very important because he is responding to the Father and he's always doing what the Father wants. Therefore, what we're seeing in Jesus Christ is a visible demonstration, an exhibit of God's will. So if, how would the disciples known what God's will was? Well, they didn't do it, learn it through theology like many people do today. They didn't learn it from getting a word, word of knowledge. That's not what they saw Jesus doing. They instead, they saw the actions of Christ, His attitudes, the words that He spoke, from situation to situation, from suffering person to suffering person, and therefore they had clarity about what God's will was for people, particularly in the area of healing, because they saw Jesus heal thousands. They never saw Him turn someone away, suggesting that their sickness was doing them some sort of unspecified kind of good. They never saw Jesus say that God was teaching someone through sickness. They never saw Jesus, a lot of these common ideas that are present in the church, that what we find is that they're absent from the ministry of Christ. Peter, James, John, and Mary would have never understood those things because they were not part of their understanding. They had not seen Jesus do those things. See, I'm convinced about this one truth, that if you can see Jesus in the way that Peter saw Jesus, perhaps, you'll have a similar ministry to Peter. You'll understand the will of the Father through Christ in the same sort of way. Let's read a, look at a few verses here, keeping in mind that Jesus uh, was doing thousands of healings and miracles. Uh, the Gospel of John tells us that if all the things that Jesus had done had been written down, not even the whole world would contain the books. Are you familiar with that verse of Scripture, the end of the Gospel of John? So in the midst of doing all these things that Jesus did as far as changing people's lives, he said things like this. John chapter 4, verse 34, Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and accomplish 
his work. I uh, mentioned this last night several times, but healing is God's idea. It's his work. See? It's, it's God the Father's idea. Jesus even himself did not initiate this idea of healing the sick. He was simply doing what the Father wanted. This is very important because many people have this backwards. They beg God to heal as if God was reluctant to heal, but healing was God's idea to begin with. See, this is a very important truth uh, that I usually have people say it. I say it usually sometimes like this. Healing is not my idea. Healing is God's idea. I don't have to convince him. He's trying to convince me. See, when you have it backwards, nothing works. You will not get people healed because you're operating in unbelief. You're thinking that somehow or another you have to convince God to heal. But the scripture declares he bore our pain, carried our sorrows. By his stripes we are healed. The work is already done at the cross. We don't have to convince God to do this. He has already done it in his son Jesus. It's just now a matter of receiving it in the same way that we receive salvation. We don't have to convince God to save the lost. It was his idea to begin with. Did you know there's not a verse of Scripture? Sometimes the church has this backwards, too. There's not a single verse of Scripture that says for us in a direct way to, say, to pray for the salvation of the lost. There's not. I Search the Scriptures. You will not find one. That idea is not present. However, there are many verses of Scripture that tell us like this, to pray the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the harvest. The problem is not them. The problem is us. Turn to somebody and say, you're the problem. <laughs> oh, and then you, were, you weren't quick to insult each other that time. You're the problem. <laughs> we all know that the other person's the problem anyway, don't we? That's right. Here we go. Um, John, Ch John chapter 5, verse 30, I can do nothing on my own initiative. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So here's Jesus healing a great multitude of people. What was he doing? Showing us what the will of the Father was. Showing us the will of the Father. Never turning anyone away. Showing us the will of the Father. Don't you know that that had a tremendous impact on the disciples? Seeing that, Jesus healed people one after another, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and the multitudes, all being healed. All being healed. Uh, the, the, the righteous and the unrighteous being healed. And you know that the multitudes that were coming to Jesus were mixed multitudes. Some had probably been to the temple, others had not. The temple was in disrepute in that day because of corruption. And many people, the average person in Jerusalem and elsewhere, knew that they were being ripped off when they went to the temple. The, the temple uh, money exchangers were required, they were required to use the temple coins, so they got ripped off in exchange. They would buy a sacrifice, required sacrifice in the temple, only to see that thing sold over and over and over again to people. They knew that the priesthood and those who were in collusion with them were ripping them off. It, the whole temple system was in disrepute in Jesus' day. That's why when, when he came in and chased out the money changers, uh, this was fairly popular action, what he did. It was not, uh, the, the, the common people would have seen that as completely righteous because of what, uh, because of the, the temple system. So lots of people had given up pretty much on what the law had, set, had said. So these people were coming to him, even the Jews in his day, many of them were not practicing the law. And uh, he, didn't, he didn't go tell them, go make the sacrifice to son. He received them all. They came, he was able to heal them simply by, by grace, uh, through faith. And they were able to receive uh, in the same way that we receive today. John chapter 5, verse 36, The works which the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. John 6, 38, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Je Jesus constantly referring the disciples back to the fact that what they were seeing him do was the will of the Father. It is very important because this is how the disciples learned to do the will of, will of God. They saw Jesus. He was the Word made flesh. And so they were, their doctrine and their teaching were wrapped around the person of Christ. They knew these things, what God wished to do, because Jesus had shown them what God wished to do. Can't you imagine being at a wedding supper and Jesus doing this miracle of, uh, you know, they run out of wine. He does this amazing miracle of supplying wine. 
Don't you know that had a tremendous impact on their thinking of what God is willing to do? Was there anybody who was, uh, was going to die if this miracle didn't happen? Was there anybody really desperate? How desperate was his family? Well, if, the, if they had run, run out of wine and, and the guests would have known eventually the party probably would have been over a little early. So God did this miracle. The Father did this miracle for what reason? To extend a party. You mean God's willing to do a miracle to extend the party? I thought it was only when, God, when people are really desperate that God will do a miracle. How'd that impact the disciples? I'm sure they understood that God the Father's grace was extravagant. That he was willing to do extravagant things way beyond the needs of people and uh, so that had a tremendous impact on their thinking. Seeing these things that Jesus did, paying, uh, paying the temple tax by telling Peter to go fishing. Uh, seeing these things had to have a tremendous impact on what they thought about the future and what God was willing to do. And that's what I'm trying to point to here. John 6, 38, I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. All the actions of Jesus, all the things he's doing are pointing his disciples back to what is it that God the Father wishes? These, I'm not doing my own thing. These are not on my own initiative, but rather these are the Father's works, constantly pointing His disciples back to these things. See, the church in our age, particularly in the area of healing, has tried to approach God in, uh, through theology, in other words, a theology of healing, versus perhaps a revelation about healing. And neither one of those ways of approaching God in the area of healing has, is very satisfactory. Um, what we see is that just a very small number of people get healed in both cases and that. However, when we approach it in this way, uh, we have seen a good, uh, a high percentage of people receive healing simply because they're able to determine the will in a much easier fashion by looking to Jesus. Uh, before, before I had this under, understanding, I, was, uh, I believed in healing, but uh, I just didn't have it working very well. I saw one or two people healed each year. And most of those people were healed as a result of me being in a circumstance where I received a word of knowledge. And uh, I was under the impression that that's the way God did it. That's what I had been taught. I had been taught that narrowness. I had to have a revelation about healing for someone before I could receive, receive their healing. However, when I began to study the ministry of Christ, all of a sudden I discovered he didn't seem to have revelations for every person. He perhaps had a general revelation of what the Father's will was, but in some cases, people got healed and Jesus didn't even know they were there. The woman with the issue of blood, she snuck up on Jesus from behind, touched his garments and received a healing. And he acknowledges her afterward, but he did not know who she was. Obviously, Jesus didn't have a revelation for her. If you go through the scriptures and he heals everyone in the multitude, the idea that he had a separate revelation for each of those people really doesn't work. What we see is that people were simply responding to the gospel of the kingdom, responding to Jesus himself, and as a result, he was able to they were able to receive healing. The vast majority of the people that I have seen over the years healed, I had no specific revelation other than Jesus. I had a lady send me an email the other day. I'd been to her church 10 years ago, and she was asking me if I had a new revelation about healing. I said, no, but I have a really old revelation about healing. His name is Jesus. <laughs> and that's really the truth. Anything that I have, any advancement that I've had in the area of healing has come by seeing him better. Seeing him reveal the will of the Father better. Seeing him, his sacrifice better. Seeing his compassion better. Um, back a few years ago, I, I began to have this puzzling experience. Uh, you know, when you travel in ministry, you do see trends in the church. And I've started seeing a particular trend that puzzled me. Uh, People who would come to me and they'd say, uh, Roger, I want to be healed for the glory of God. In many cases, I had trouble getting them healed. We just didn't seem to be getting people who said that healed. Now, that sounds like a really noble cause, doesn't it? It sounds so noble, and yet uh, I was not getting those people healed. And sometimes when uh, it was more women than men that said this to me, but uh, I want to be healed so I can raise my children for Christ. Uh, we didn't see those people healed either. And it really puzzled me because a, a noble cause, you know, you know, you would think that people would, uh, that things would be really good about that. In any case, so I uh, began to pray about it and said, Lord, you know, I've seen this trend now for, for at least a year. 
I need to understand it better so I, so I can help these people with, uh, receive their healing. And uh, the first thing I noticed in Scripture is that Jesus did not heal people because they had a noble cause. Did you notice that? Have you ever noticed that? There's an, in fact, it doesn't really reveal their causes in Scripture for their healing. And, uh, but it does reveal his motives. It says he moved with compassion and healed the sick. And then also, uh, there's another little wrinkle in this that, that caught my attention, is that Jesus, I was aware of this before, but you know, I'm putting it into this context. Um, he often says to people, don't tell anyone after he heals them. Have you noticed that? Now, if he was only healing for the glory of God, he would say, tell everyone, go tell everyone. Instead, he says sometimes, don't tell anyone. So obviously, he's not healing for that motive. And the motive is, of course, compassion. So I, I, the Lord began to put these pieces together for me, and I began to realize what I was dealing with. I was dealing with people who did not believe that just being sick, just being in pain was enough to motivate God to heal them. They didn't believe that was enough. They believed that somehow or another they had to have a more noble cause than that to receive a healing. And so they invented a noble cause. And when they tried to approach God with this invented noble cause for their healing, uh, their conscience would cry out and they couldn't come near to him. They, in other words, their conscience would say, you liar. You just want to be healed because you're tired of being sick. And so what I finally found out what to do is that when people said that to me, I said, you know what? Why don't we let God take care of his own glory? You know what? I think that if you had a child and that child was in pain, you would not require that child to have a good motive for their healing other than wanting to be out of pain. And that's how God feels about you. He just, because he loves you, because he's your father, he doesn't want you to be in pain anymore. It's quite all right just to want to be free from pain. And what happened was, I, because I broke through this invented motive, that people were able to come more honestly and receive their healing. You get this? I think God wants you to be healed not because it's going to do Him any good. He wants you to be healed because it's going to do you some good. He loves you. Come on, shake your head. Is this good news? <laughs> All right. John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Now, that's a very familiar verse of Scripture. And the context of it is a certain disciple saying something to Jesus. His name was Thomas. What do you know about Thomas? Yeah, that's right. He's gotten tagged with the idea of doubt. Okay? The reason being is that he was not present at the first appearance of Jesus first resurrection appearance of Jesus, and so when he heard the story from the other disciples, he didn't believe it and doubted that it was true. And then Jesus restored him in the second. What you may not know about Thomas is Thomas is one of the least distinguished of the disciples. In comparison to some of the other disciples, he didn't accomplish nearly as much. Um, and there's another disciple here in this passage as well who fits that same category. Let's read on a little further. Let me read, pick that up at the first verse again. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, now Philip, uh, is the, this is a, there are several Philips in the scriptures. This is Philip, the apostle Philip, the follower of Christ, the, one of the twelve. And the other Philip, of course, is Philip the evangelist, who's in the book of Acts. They're not the same person, different person. And uh, here, this particular Philip, I was also known to not to be very successful in comparison to the other apostles. Now, this particular passage of Scripture, just to give you a little history, the Gospel of John is the last book of the New Testament written. It's the last book of the Scriptures written. It was written after John was uh, more than 100 years old. He had migrated. He had been released from the Isle of Patmos where, where the Revelation was written. And uh, he had migrated eventually to the city of Ephesus where there was a church planted originally by the Apostle Paul. And Paul had already been martyred by, uh, by Nero uh, in Rome. So all the other apostles except for John now have passed away, including the Apostle Paul. And so he is the only living one of the apostles who was a witness of the resurrection. 
And the, according to the church fathers, the early church fathers, they had come to John and said, we know what the other Gospels say. We have Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptic Gospels. We have these Gospels. We know what they say about what Jesus did and said, but we don't understand exactly what all, all this means. So John begins to explain to the elders of Ephesus uh, and is penciled down, basically written down, and becomes the Gospel of John. That's why it's... John takes on a different characteristic. It has more explanation in it than any of the other Gospels. So it is the last book of the New Testament written, and John knows what has happened to all the other apostles. He knows their history. He knows how they died. He knows how successful they were. So he, interestingly enough, he brings out this conversation between Jesus and two of his disciples who are known by John not to be very successful. And he is going to tell us why in this passage. This interaction between Jesus and these apostles shows us why these two apostles weren't very, very effective. Uh, let me read it from the verse, verse, first verse again. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it's enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How do you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me. Otherwise, believe on the account of the works themselves. Now, this is corrective. He's telling Philip, let me read that portion of it. That's the correction. Have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? This is Jesus correcting Philip, saying, you should have already understood this. You should have already understood this relationship that I have with the Father. When you see me, you see the Father. See, the early, the early church had some clarity about this, that they were seeing the will of the Father. They were seeing the Father's desires when Jesus ministered. They had clarity about this in some sense. Of course, Philip obviously still didn't get it. In my experience, when we're teaching people to do healing ministry, uh, this is fundamental. If they don't get this, they won't get healing working. It's that simple. Um, because 80% of getting healing working, 90% maybe, of getting healing working is really understanding what the will of God is. And if you see it like the 12 did, because Christ is revealing the will of the Father, then when someone stands in front of you, you're more persistent. You uh, don't give up as quickly. You pray through. You know that it's supposed to happen. Even if it doesn't happen, you know it's supposed to. You ought look for opportunities to continue to pray, even if you can't get them, get them healed in the first time you pray with them. Uh, I have, a, I have a, a blown up photograph on one of my walls at home that reminds me of this particular truth. My son John was, uh, my youngest son, John, was traveling with me. I had three boys. And uh, he happened to snap a picture. I didn't know he had done it, but it just turned out to be a real demonstration of uh, what, uh, what I believe about healing. And uh, in any case, uh, it's me kind of kneeling at, at a chair, and there's a young woman sitting in the chair. It kind of looks like I'm asking her to marry me or something. But, uh, but what was actually happening is that she had damaged her right foot. And uh, she was a ballerina and had trained all her youth to be a ballerina and had hurt her, hurt her foot in a fall. And uh, she'd had two operations on the foot to correct the problem, and she still couldn't dance without pain. And she had determined her, the will of God through her experience. Bad idea. And uh, she had determined since she couldn't dance anymore, and she'd had prayer half a dozen times for her foot, uh, that uh, God was leading her into a different profession. And uh, she heard me say that, uh, that the Holy Spirit guides us in the will of God, not sickness. That sickness and experience, you know, uh, we see people healed after 15 years of trying to receive a healing. Uh, obviously, the 15 years did not reveal the will of the Father. Okay? So, but in any case, uh, so she sat down after hearing me preach the good news uh, about it and, and wanted prayer. I prayed for her the first time. Uh, I said, Try your foot. She got up on the foot. She says it still hurts. I said, sit back down. Uh, prayed for her a second time. Uh, got her back up to dance again, try again. She tried again, and she said, well, it doesn't hurt anymore, but it's very stiff. 
Now, I know something about stiffness I don't know, but I didn't know in those days. Stiffness simply means stretch. If the pain's gone, you receive your healing. You know, that we used to, we used to continue to pray until the stiffness was gone. And in this case, I did anyway. So I sat her, sat her back down. I got her prayed for her a third time. She said it was better, but it's still stiff. The fourth time I prayed for her, she got up. She danced for 40 minutes without stopping, weeping the whole time. Weeping the whole time, saying that God had given her back her heart's desire. So one of the things, that when you know what God's will is, it changes your behavior in these circumstances. You stick with it. You don't, uh, you don't quit. Before, uh, if I didn't get you healed in the first 30 seconds or so, if something wasn't happening in 30 seconds, uh, me praying for you, the next uh, few minutes I was spending basically trying to figure out how to get out of this situation gracefully. Seriously. I didn't want to embarrass you. I didn't want to embarrass myself. And probably would have said something rather medieval to you. Maybe God doesn't want to heal you right now. Maybe it's not his timing. It's very medieval. It's not, it's not New Testament. Maybe uh, he has a purpose for you remaining sick. I would have said something like that, thinking that I was comforting you. And the truth was I wasn't comforting you. I was sowing doubt into your circumstance. When you really realize that Jesus healed everyone who came, never turned anyone away, then there is no timing for healing but now. It's not the, and who determined the timing? They did, not Jesus. They determined it by coming. The woman with the issue of blood made a decision. She determined the time of her healing, not Jesus. We, a lot of this stuff is really backwards. When you look at the New Testament that we've been taught, God has a timing for healing. No, no, no. No, the timing's in our hands. Um, God has a purpose for me remaining sick. Well, then Jesus was undoing the purpose in every person's life. <laughs> by healing every person who came, uh, that God's will is different for different people, you know, or changes, his, his will is constantly changing. No, we just don't see that in the ministry of Christ. Healing everyone, the good and the bad, in the multitude shows us that God's will remains the same. He wants you to receive what Jesus has done at the cross. If there was a cross right there, I'd be pointing at it. He bore your pain, carried your sorrows, by his stripes you are healed. Already done for you, just a matter of receiving. This, uh, this passage goes on to finish the last few phrases and are very powerful. He who believes in me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do because I go to the Father. Now this is a general promise. He who believes in me, the works that I do shall he do also. Do you believe in Jesus? He who believes in me, the works that I do shall he do also. That means you. The works that Jesus was doing, you will do also if you believe in him. But it's not generic believing. Just not, if you'd asked me, uh, you know, in 19, 1973, 4, somewhere in that period of time, I was familiar with healing already. I was a brand new Christian. Uh, and probably had had one or two experiences already with healing at that point. If you'd asked me how you heal the sick, how the sick are healed, I would have said by faith in Jesus Christ. But that's not enough. It's not specific enough. Because this, this kind of faith that he's talking about, the believing he's talking about is what he's just said to Philip. When you see me, you see the Father. Don't you believe that I'm in the Father and the Father's in me? Don't you believe that this, this relationship you see with that I am demonstrating to you exactly what Father wants? See, the reason why the church has been fuzzy about healing has been unclear about what the will of God is because they've looked at the wrong things. Because looking to Christ and seeing the will of the Father there, all of a sudden all the fuzziness begins to disappear. But if you're looking to your experience, you're look, looking for a revelation about whether or not you're supposed to be well, you're going to remain fuzzy. You're not going to have clarity about the will of God and therefore you won't persist the proper kind of way in order to receive. Does that make sense to you? And see, that's been the problem of the church, is that we have looked in the wrong places. My, uh, I have an evangelist friend, he says that Jesus is the best kept secret of the American church. How about the British church, is it? <laughs> that Jesus, uh, we've seen Jesus on his cross, but sometimes we've left, it, left him there and not realized that he taught his disciples for three years, and we've neglected what he's taught his disciples. Look, we've advanced on to the epistles, not ruling that the epistles are built on the apostles, <laughs> what they were trained by Jesus. 
The, the fact is that most of the letters, of, uh, letters written there are people who knew Jesus, who met Jesus. Uh, and as a result of that, they were able to understand what the will of the Father was. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 is at the top of page 5 in the booklet. We had a couple. Wait, did you get a booklet by any chance? Would you like one? We have some more, TD? All the booklets gone here. There's another package of them back there in the box. If I get TD. Oh, well, he's. Oh. All right. Top of page 5, Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. He, Christ, is the image of the invisible God. That's a very similar statement to Paul. Uh, Paul is saying here, when you see Christ, you're seeing the invisible God. It's very similar to what Jesus said, when you see me, you see the Father. Uh, as Paul is expressing the same, same particular truth. The writer of Hebrews also expresses that truth. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. God, after He spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets, in many portions, in many ways... In these last days is spoken to us in his son. That particular long sentence describes old versus new. Old Testament, God spoke through prophets to the fathers. Moses being the primary prophet, okay? God spoke through prophets to the fathers. In the New Testament, in the New Covenant, he's speaking to us in his son. And he goes on to say, he, that's Christ, is the radiance of of His glory and the exact representation of His nature. He, Christ, is the radiance of the Father's glory and the exact representation of the Father's nature. So you want to know what the Father is like? Well, Jesus is the visible representation of that. You can see what the Father is like, what He wants for us. And so what do we see? What do we see Jesus doing? Saving, healing, delivering, setting free, making whole. We never see Jesus making someone sick, causing trouble in their circumstance. We never see Jesus. He's bringing life and life abundantly. He's never doing the opposite, destroying lives. What we see is the Father's will expressed in the new covenant, which is, in, in a short word, is grace. God giving us gifts, eternal life, blessing, healing, strength, all the things that we need in order to live an abundant life. Mark chapter 9, verse 2. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. Jesus was transfigured before them, and his garments became radiant and exceedingly white, as no launder on earth can whiten them. And Elijah appeared to them along with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to answer, for they became terrified. Then a cloud form overshadowing them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved Son, listen to him. Now, here uh, the three disciples, uh, Peter being the primary one here that the passage talks about, go up on the mount with Jesus, and Jesus is glowing with white light. He was transfigured before them, and Moses and Elijah appear to them. By the way, uh, artist renditions of this are often wrong. Uh, if you see artist rendition, they usually have Jesus, Moses, and Elijah all glowing with light. But it doesn't say that. It just says Jesus was. He was transfigured. And Moses and Elijah appeared to him. And uh, if, if, I, if, if we heard Peter say this, I suspect it didn't say, it wasn't, it wasn't spoken as calmly as I read it a moment ago. Probably uh, with a lot of stuttering. I think Peter was having a hallelujah breakdown when it was happening. I think that the adrenaline must have been flowing pretty good. This when he's seeing this thing. Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Oh. <laughs> I have no shame. <laughs> and I, I'll even sing for you later. How's that? <laughs> I threaten you. With, in fact, if you're late from the break later on, I'll, I, I, I promise you I'll sing to you. <laughs> Um, in any case, uh, what we see here is, uh, you know, uh, Peter getting very excited here and out of fear. He makes this statement. Sometimes when people are nervous, uh, they talk. Uh, other people, you know, they, they withdraw and they grow silent when they're nervous and so on. But some people talk. And I'm one of those folks, you know, when I'm nervous. And uh, he did not know what to answer for they became terrified. And then a cloud form, overshadowing, the voice came out of the cloud and said, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Now, there's another place in the scripture where 
it says something very similar where God speaks. You remember that one at Jesus' baptism? But in that situation, it's not, this is my beloved son, it's you are. You are my beloved son. Yes, it doesn't say listen to me, but I, whom I'm well pleased. Um, in this particular circumstance, who is God the Father talking to? He's not talking to Jesus because he says, this is. He's talking to Peter. He's responding to what Peter has said. Now, what has Peter said? Let's make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. An equality between you and Elijah and a Moses. And what does the father say? No. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Not to Moses, not to Elijah. See, in the new covenant, we listen to Christ. He is the one who teaches us what the new covenant is like and demonstrates it to us in the Gospels. He was doing all those things in the area of healing before the cross, but he was doing them on the basis of the cross. Matthew's Gospel tells us he was doing that in fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 53. He was healing the sick before the cross. God was giving a grace loan, so to speak. And that's why he's able to forgive sins. That's why he's able to for, you know, heal by faith. All the kinds of things. He's demonstrating us what the new covenant looks like before it actually is made completely. Thankfully, he's been able to do that for us. So he is, the, he is the perfect model of what the new covenant looks like. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 says this, Christ Jesus, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself, being, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death of the cross. Now, if I were to say to in any church, uh, any uncultic church, I guess I should say, uh, that Jesus was both God and man, everybody would say amen. Everybody believes that's true, yes? I believe he was both God and man, but this passage says that he emptied himself of his capacity as being God. Now this is important because some of the reasons why people have neglected the Gospels is because they see God healing the sick there. Jesus... God the Son healing the sick. But what you actually are seeing is Jesus, Son of Man, healing the sick. You're seeing the Anointed One who was God and, and emptied Himself of all His capacity as God and now is doing it as a perfect human being. And therefore He becomes the real model for you and I of what this looks like. Jesus Himself becomes the model to His disciples. They saw a real live man who didn't have advanced knowledge of all, all events didn't know the woman with the issue of blood was there. He is disappointed at the uh, other, the nine lepers who did not return to thank him. Uh, we see different times that Jesus uh, is caught by surprise by certain things. The scripture says he marvels. Uh, he, the, anybody uh, that is caught by surprise uh, doesn't know everything in advance. What we see is Jesus ate and drank in their midst. They knew that he was a real live human being operating by the power of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't Jesus who healed the sick. It was the Spirit of God through him healing the sick in the same way that it happens right now. Now, the bottom line is that God used him in the same way that we get used, that so far he becomes our perfect model. Back a few years ago, I was uh, walking in the mall with my wife, and uh, I don't think we were being particularly spiritual other than just being together. I don't remember, we remember what we were talking about. But in any case, I had my arm up around her, and I felt healing flow from the inside of my arm to the back of her neck. And I said, uh, sweetie, uh, typically in America, Americans call their, their wives honey. At least in our region, they do. And, but our dog is named Honey, but if I call her Honey, the dog comes. So, so I call her sweetie. I, uh, sweetie, uh, I felt healing flow from the inside of my arm to the back of your neck. Are you feeling all right? She said, well, uh, uh, actually, I've had a little bit of a headache, and my, my uh, shoulders and, and neck have, have felt pretty tense. I said, well, how does it feel now? She said, yeah, it actually feels pretty good. I said, well, uh, what about the headache? She said, hmm, seems to be gone. I said, uh, why didn't you tell me that you weren't feeling well? I said, you, re you do realize I'm in healing ministry. <laughs> And she said, well, I did tell the Lord. Now think what happened here. 
she reached out to Jesus, her healer. She looked to Jesus, her healer. And Jesus, her healer, in me, healed her. And I wasn't really involved. See how this works? The, the truth is, is that we feel things happen through us. And when we're praying for the sick, uh, anybody who does this is going to have some stories to tell where they felt something through. Is that true, Helen? You feel stuff happen through you. You feel electricity. You feel heat. You feel the, what people call the anointing of the Spirit, okay, working through you. But it is the Holy Spirit doing it. It's not us. And while we understand how to cooperate with Him in that area, to put ourselves in the circumstance where it's going to happen, we know that we need to believe when we pray. We need to focus our attention on Jesus in the context of the good news that things really do happen a lot more frequently. We do understand that, but we understand that it's not us doing it. Uh, and uh, as a result of that, we can take no glory for it. We're really glad to, for God to use us. I am very glad when God uses me in that kind of way. I'm, but the truth is, is that um, I'm very aware that it's because of what Jesus has done, not because of what Roger has done. Shake your head. You get this? It's because of him that it actually is happening. And, and but keeping pointing back to Jesus, this is the way it happened with Jesus. See? He recognized it was the Holy Spirit doing, working it through him. He recognized it was on the basis of the cross, where he, which he was not yet to go to, but that was going to happen. He recognized that what he was going to accomplish at the cross was purchasing all this for humanity. He was very clear about those things and operated very, in a very humble fashion as a result of that. Let's consider Jesus healed. Christ healed all who came to him. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 16, healed all that were ill. In that passage itself, if you read a little further, you'll find that Matthew, who was one of the twelve, tells us that Jesus was doing it on the basis of fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 53. Now, Isaiah chapter 53 is about the cross. It's a, it's, a, it's a prophetic statement about the cross. And so what we're seeing there is Matthew tells us that Jesus was healing the sick because of the cross, even though he had not yet gone there. Uh, we, I've called it in one of my other books, the book out there called Grace in the Gospels, I've called it a grace loan. God was loaning grace for the time when Christ would actually fulfill the covenant and sacrifice himself on the cross. So all the healing that you see happening in the ministry of Christ is exactly the way we do it today. He's exactly performing uh, uh, as an example to you and I of what healing is supposed to look like. And so that's how his disciples learned how to do it. If you'd ask Peter, James, John, Mary in that day, how do you do healing? You do it just like Jesus. Everybody get this? All right, good. Matthew chapter 12, verse 15, Many followed him, and he healed them all. Now, was Jesus healing everyone in the multitude, uh, uh, everyone in the region when this was happening, or who was he healing? Those who followed him, yeah. The other one that said, uh, and he healed all who were ill, who had come to him in that particular circumstance. And then Luke chapter 6, 19, all the multitude were trying to touch him. This is the top of page 6, 6 in your booklet. All the multitude were trying to touch him, for power was going from him and healing them all. Uh, who was being healed in this circumstance? Those who were trying to touch him. See, it's a question of who was coming to receive. See, many times uh, over the years I've encountered groups of believers who theoretically believe in healing, but they kind of think of it as a lottery. That God's just kind of looking down and picking who's going to be healed. That's not what was happening in the New Testament. People who were being healed were the ones that were coming to Jesus for healing. And so, in fact, you know, occasionally I've had to convince leaders that that's not the way it works. If you think if you have a lottery mentality, that's what you're going to get. You're going to get just a few people healed. Uh, that, the idea that God is changing his mind and picking certain people to be healed, that's not really the way it works. It's exactly opposite from that. In fact, if, if God has picked people to be healed, he's picked the entire world. That's really true that Christ has paid the price, bore our pain, carried our sorrows by his stripes who were healed. Acts chapter 5, verse 12 through 16, the disciples healed all who came. And then in Acts chapter 38, Christ healed all those who were oppressed by the devil is what the general description. Now, this is a little bit of a thing that we call the time machine. It's something I've used many times in hospital rooms, circumstances where I didn't have a lot of time to explain healing to people. It's a... Uh, it's a technique 
uh, use it as a technique in order to simplify the whole business of healing for people. Uh, because I think that there are two issues you have to deal with to get people healed in Western culture, in the Western church. And that is, number one, you have to help them determine what the will of God is for themselves. Because you can't pray in faith unless you believe it's God's will for you to receive. The second thing is on the basis of why are we going to receive. And the second thing is really about righteousness. Are we going to receive because we're righteous or are we going to receive because of what Jesus has done? So the two things are, go hand in hand. The will of God is easily resolved by this particular uh, illustration and... Quite frankly, so is the other problem, if uh, we, you can make the same kind of application. And the question goes like this, if I could get you into a time machine and go back 2,000 years with you to one of those healing events where Jesus is healing everyone, wouldn't he heal you? It's pretty simple. The answer, of course, yes. You know, obviously, if he's healing everyone in the multitude, then you would qualify just like everyone else. Well, obviously, we don't have a time machine, but we don't need one because that very same Jesus has come forward 2,000 years and is healing everyone. Uh, you know, uh, he, because he healed everyone then, we can know that he's willing to, sing, uh, willing to heal everyone now as, uh, as well. So uh, the scripture says if, uh, that he is the same yesterday, today, and yes, forever. So that very same Jesus who was healing in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is also doing the same things in the same way today. Unfortunately, the church has presented another Jesus to us, a Jesus who's not always willing. That's a different Jesus. The Jesus of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, somebody comes with someone sick, he immediately responds in a favorable way to them. There's only one occasion when that didn't happen. Are you aware of that occasion? The Syrophoenician woman... Jesus and his disciples have gone outside the borders of Israel, apparently to take a rest. A woman who is not a Jew comes to Jesus, and she asks for healing for her daughter. And uh, Jesus says no to her. He actually says no to her several times in this circumstance. And he says on the basis of the fact that, that, that what I have is, belongs to the Jews, it's the children's bread, is what he says. It's the children's bread. It belongs to the Jews. And she argues with him about this. She's persistent about it and eventually makes this argument. And says, he says it's not good for uh, the children's bread to be given to dogs, is what Jesus says to her. Sounds quite insulting, doesn't it? And, uh, but she doesn't take it as an insult. She turns it, on, turns it on its head and said, all I need is a few crumbs off out, out of the children's bread in order to, for this to work for me. She's saying, it's a really a strong expression of faith. She's saying, what you have, Jesus, is so great so powerful that all I need is a few crumbs for my need to be met. And Jesus uh, commends her in that circumstance for having great faith. And she gets what she was looking for. So the only person that the New Testament, does, uh, the New Testament, uh, uh, the only person that Jesus says no to in the Gospels also got what they were looking for. Is this good news? <laughs> I think it is too. Persistence got to John. By the way, the gospel has gone to the whole world now. It's not just to the Jews. In that particular point in time that Jesus has sent his disciples just to the Jews. But in his ascension, right before his ascension, he, he sent them to the whole world. And uh, so the, the gospel has gone to the whole world at this point. <laughs>